All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, it's a distinct pleasure to be the moderator of our inaugural kickoff climate solutions web series with Georgia Drawdown. Um, I'm calling today uh, from the Velo offices um, where I work, and as a, a member of the advisory board for Georgia Drawdown, um, I speak on behalf of a really, really great organization. The topic today is scalable solar in Georgia, and we've got three really, really interesting panelists and experts and leaders and thought leaders, and I get the pleasure of kicking them off, and I can see that um, it looks like Linwood has joined. Welcome. Glad, glad you're with us. Um, uh, I'll do a quick introduction. I have three slides of just as moderator, I get to pull rank and I get to share some thoughts. I'm going to share a wish, wish list and a little bit of update on large solar projects in Georgia. So um, let me begin by saying we're not going back to normal. We live in a world of abundance and we really need to work together to create a new vision, a new vocabulary, and a new narrative. And we've seen Ali doing that in transportation innovation. We're seeing it from these other panelists. Uh, the other thing is that change is really accelerating. And so things that were working well um, before the pandemic, much of that started working better like digitization, uh, other things um, really are struggling and, and we're gonna see that acceleration continuing. And that we are in what I like to call the death of the fossil fuel era and the death of the industrial age. And the end of ages don't go quietly into good night. They're usually fights and struggles and, and really big conflicts. And that's where a lot of the disinformation that we see in this space occurring. And it's really, really something I think we need to actually spend a little time thinking about it. And in doing so, we need to be thinking in a transdisciplinary fashion and become more and more ecosystem thinkers because this is all connected. Energy, the environment, the climate, jobs, lives, education, it's all much more of an ecosystem than I think we often think. And the one thing I've learned very recently that I'm sharing with a lot of people, it's a one sentence thing that says, we really need to stop focusing, particularly as business people, on the maximization of profits and focus on the optimization of our business, government, nonprofit, institution for all stakeholders. So, so those are some things that are on my mind that I wanted to just share with us as we begin this. And I'll try to tie it together at the end, but I also have a wish list. You know, what am I thinking about as a solar professional? I'm obviously thinking about more solar, but very specifically solar for everyone, everywhere. And that means across communities, incomes, you know, we need a lot more diversity in our workforce. There's so many things we need to do. We need more distributed generation. We need to have a mix of about 80% large scale solar and 20% distributed generation. And there are many benefits to doing that. Um, in Georgia, we have a real focus and about 96% of the solar in Georgia is very large scale. We need to do more energy storage. We need to do more electric transportation, both for personal and fleets. And in general, we just need more innovation in everything that we're doing. So lastly, a little update. In preparing for this, I actually sat down and thought, you know, I don't really know what is the largest operational solar plant in Georgia right now. So I reached out to my friend, Wilson Mallard, and I said, Wilson, you know, give me an update. What's the, the largest solar project in Georgia? And it's the 200 megawatt project in Twiggs County, Georgia, um, built by my friends at Origins. And uh, we built one of the first 20 megawatts. We built the first megawatt in Georgia together. So. Now they're up to 200 megawatts. People laughed at us when we were gonna build a megawatt of solar. Um, Georgia Power will own their largest plant at Warner Robins Air Force Base, and that'll be 120 mega, 20, 128 megawatt plant. And then so you've got a, a 213 megawatt plant under construction, and then another 220 megawatt facility that just got a PPA. So a lot of activity here, and that, that leads us into our discussions today. And um, at this point, I'm going to introduce, um, we're gonna go with Linwood first. Is that, or we're gonna go stay with Michael? What, Lisa, keep me on, on schedule here. We are gonna hear from Michael Riley okay. at the All Nature right. Conservancy. And, and while Michael's presenting, I just wanna um, ask everybody if you have a question 
for Michael, if you want to put it in the chat and at the end, James will be um, offering some of those questions to our panelists. Okay, and actually I have a couple more housekeeping things I'm gonna mention before we start. The first one is that uh, new events in the calendar will be posted at www.drawdownga.org. Um, this presentation will be on the YouTube channel um, and a couple of other things. If you haven't seen John Lanier's TED Talk, I definitely recommend you take a look at that. He's done some really great, uh, interesting things there. He's, he's becoming a really powerful communicator around climate and these topics. So once again, a uh, quick introduction of Michael O'Reilly, who is the Director of Policy and Climate Strategy for the Nature Conservancy. And he's gonna share some fascinating work uh, that they've been doing. Uh, then we're gonna go um, to Allie Kelly, uh, someone I have tremendous respect for and a personal friend who's the Executive Director of the Ray and doing some of the most innovative uh, transportation work in the country in an area where you can innovate, you can't do things here. And she continues to, uh, with inspiration, inspire innovation across Georgia and across the country. And then we're going to hear from Linwood Coleman, who is the Chief Program Officer at Brownswell, and also um, a nine-year Air Force veteran. We honor his service in that. So at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Michael, and we're going to have him give us a presentation. If you have questions, put them in the chat, and hopefully we're going to have a little bit of lively dialogue at the end. So at this point, take it away, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. And thank you to Drawdown Georgia and the Racy Anderson Foundation uh, for this opportunity today. Uh, and um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation with these great colleagues on the panel. The expansion of solar energy in Georgia has been an exciting development that's helping to position our state for economic growth and sustainability. The Nature Conservancy supports this solar expansion and the broader transition from carbon intensive fuels like coal to clean energy sources. We need to move rapidly to low carbon energy generation to meet the challenges that we face from climate change. Along with that challenge, we're also seeing a sharp decline in biodiversity around the world. The United Nations has estimated that we're in danger of losing a quarter of plant and animal species to extinction within the next few decades unless we take action to stop it. Now, much of that decline will be linked to a loss of habitat. So as we move forward with ramping up our capacity for renewable energy generation in Georgia, in the United States, around the world, we have to do it in smart ways that give us the clean energy that we need while protecting the lands and nature that we cherish. Large arrays um, of solar panels, as we all know, uh, require extensive land area for deployment. Utility scale solar facilities on average require between five to 10 acres of land for every megawatt of power that they generate. As Georgia grows its solar generation to provide half or more of wide demand, it could require the disruption and the development of up to a quarter million additional acres of land for large scale solar facilities. Where we site these solar facilities can make a huge difference. Next slide, please. The Nature Conservancy is working to help guide renewable energy de development to areas with low impact on sensitive lands and habitat. Siting facilities in these low impact locations provides an opportunity to developers to avoid conflicts that can delay construction. Now, what do I mean by low impact locations? Well, these are areas where the land has already been significantly altered for buildings, for infrastructure, other development activities. It could be uh, marginal farmland where soil is depleted and it's no longer considered you know, prime farmland. These are areas that are ripe for that type of development. For example, in this photo, we see a solar facility established on the site of a former mining operation in Nevada. Areas like this and other locations previously used for commercial or industrial purposes can make ideal sites for large scale solar facilities. The benefits of developing in low impact areas include reduced conflict and costs for development, economic gain for communities, uh, minimized impacts to wildlife and habitat, and it will retain the carbon that's currently being stored in our forest and natural lands. 
to help distinguish between areas with low impact and those with higher environmental impact, the Nature Conservancy worked with partners to develop a mapping tool that helps developers identify sites in Georgia that are good for solar energy generation and pose minimal impact to sensitive lands and, and critical habitat. Uh, we were led by our climate and lands coordinator, Amy Gutierrez, in developing the solar, uh, the low impact solar siting tool in partnership with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources, with the University of Georgia, and with NASA. And what you see right now on the screen is a screenshot of the tool. And then we'll take a closer look and later we'll tell you how to, you can access the low impact solar siting tool yourself online. You can go to the next slide. So what went into creating the tool? We drew on a range of data uh, relevant to solar suitability and environmental sensitivity. The solar suitability factors included proximity of the land to transmission lines, the solar insulation or how much solar energy <clears throat> that land receives, and other inputs like uh, aspect, land slope, and land use land cover data. When we look at the <clears throat> environmental, excuse me, <clears throat> environmental sensitivity factors, that analysis looked at things like the location of protected and conservation lands, critical habitat for key species, prime farmland, and landscape connectivity. So put it all together and we get this map um, where the formula we're using is high solar suitability plus low environmental sensitivity equals preferred solar siting. So if you look at that uh, graph on the right, in the upper right, the vertical axis ranks solar suitability factors. The horizontal axis assesses environmental sensitivity. So land that ranked high for solar suitability and low for environmental sensitivity, this is preferred for low impact solar development. And that land represented on the map in green. Less preferred areas are this uh, bluish color and land that ranked high in environmental sensitivity, land we would not want to see developed in that way, or ranked low in solar suitability would be designated as not preferred. And then you'll also see some gray areas on the map. And those gray areas are protected lands that are off limits for new solar development. And that would include, for example, areas like the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge down in the south of the state, or the Chattahoochee National Forest in the north of the state. So what do we get when we look at that together? Well, an analysis of the data uh, provides us with good news. Using that criteria that we discussed, we can see that more than 60% of Georgia's land falls into that preferred category of having both strong solar suitability and low environmental sensitivity. Um, so we are now beginning to work uh, with solar developers, utilities, state and local officials to guide the development of future solar facilities, large scale solar facilities to these preferred areas. And the benefits of constructing solar facilities in low impact areas extend beyond helping wildlife and trees, however. You know, increasingly, it's also benefiting the bottom line. A growing number of corporations and other large energy buyers have set their own renewable energy goals, and they're securing power purchase agreements to meet those needs. Many of them are paying close attention to where that renewable energy comes from. Salesforce, a company many of you will recognize, a $20 billion software company, has developed a procurement matrix to guide its renewable energy purchasing decisions. The Nature Conservancy and Groundswell, both represented here today in this webinar, uh, were among the organizations that helped uh, Salesforce develop the criteria for this tool. The procurement matrix assesses a range of factors, including the energy facilities impact on land, habitat, and wildlife. And so, for example, in that realm, energy from a solar facility for example, or wind facility, any facility that is built in critical habitat 
is ruled out altogether. Salesforce will not purchase uh, energy generated from that location. Their rankings then range from low grades for facilities that might be placed on somewhat problematic locations like other kinds of natural lands and, pro and prime farmland and to higher grades that they would give to energy that's generated on land that's already been modified or that is in the built environment already. In other words, low impact locations. So Salesforce is working with REBA, the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance with the Nature Conservancy uh, and with others to promote the integration of criteria like these into the procurement processes of other corporations and institutions. I think that the, the business community is increasingly playing a leading role in shaping a sustainable future. Um, the decisions that they make in choosing low impact renewable energy will be pivotal in ensuring that there is sufficient supply for this well-sourced clean energy. And we are looking forward to partnering with companies across Georgia to create a solar future for our state where people and nature thrive together. And finally, on this uh, last slide here is the web address where you can access our low impact solar siting tool yourself. And if you have questions, if you'd like more information, please contact us. Thank you. Michael, that was great. I really got a couple of things out of that that were really, you know, to me, the top takeaways, the, your biodiversity comment with 25% of lost habitat in the near term. Um, I, I definitely, I'm, I'm becoming a half earther and I've been trying to learn more about Theo Wilson and his work there. This procurement matrix is really important because it's not enough just to say we're buying recs and we're doing the right thing. You can buy recs and that can be a powerful tool, but you need to look at these, these overall impacts. And of course, as a, as a total map nerd, I loved everything you're doing with NASA and all that work. So cartography, globes, something I really love. So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions right now for Michael? Just a couple of quick ones or, or do we want to quickly go to the next session and open it up for more? Anybody have a quick um, question for the chat. All right, we're going to have a little more Q&A later then. At this point, I get to introduce yep. my, my friend, Allie Kelly, and she's going to tell us about innovating in an area that's really, really hard to innovate in. So take it away, Allie. Thank you, James. It's so good to see everyone. My name's Allie Kelly. I'm executive director of a nonprofit organization called The Ray, and I'm really excited to be a part of the kickoff for Drawdown Georgia's webinar series. Next slide, please. Um, so what is the Ray? The Ray has become the nation's premier test bed and testing lab for transportation technology and innovating transportation to be zero deaths, zero carbon and zero waste. We at the Ray believe that the technologies already exist for transportation to be safer, cleaner, and more productive. And in a partnership with Georgia DOT and the Federal Highway Administration over the last five years, we've actually incorporated more than a dozen innovative projects on an 18 mile corridor of Interstate 85 in West Georgia. Next slide, please. So who is the Ray? <laughs> the Ray also refers to the Ray C. Anderson Memorial Highway, which is that special 18 mile stretch of interstate that begins on I-85 at the Georgia, Alabama state line at the banks of the Chattahoochee River and extends north into the state of Georgia for 18 miles ending at exit 18, which is the main exit for LaGrange, Georgia. West Point is the city where Ray Anderson was born and LaGrange is the city where his carpet company Interface was born. And we work on this particular 18 mile corridor because the state of Georgia worked with Ray Anderson's family, including his youngest daughter, Harriet Anderson Langford, to establish this 18 mile corridor connecting two hometowns as a memorial and a recognition of the fantastic legacy that Ray Anderson left, not only in the business world, but also in the global world of sustainability and circularity 
um, in manufacturing and in large corporations. Next slide, please. This is just a broad overview of some of the projects that we have brought online on the 18 mile corridor known as the Ray Highway in a chartered partnership with Georgia DOT and the Federal Highway Administration. Again, our guiding goals, our mission and our principles on the Ray really revolve around reducing crashes and fatalities, zeroing out transportation carbon emissions, and also incorporating more circular economy and circularity principles into the transportation sector to reduce wastefulness and to make more productive use of existing assets and transportation infrastructure. Ray Anderson's work at Interface is our guiding light and our founder and president is Ray Anderson's youngest daughter, Harriet, who asked the first important question, what if highways were sustainable? On this 18 mile corridor, we brought online a variety of projects, including rubber modified asphalt, um, working with innovations in uh, uh, vegetative management at our landscape lab at exit six, working with companies like Panasonic and 3M to pave the way for connected and autonomous vehicles. And we've also done quite a bit of work in the area of renewable energy, electrification and transportation. Next slide, please. So the first project that I wanna talk with you about today is our megawatt of solar at exit 14 of the Ray Highway. You can see at the very bottom of your screen, a class eight truck going north on the Ray Highway. And so this megawatt of solar exists at the southbound lanes and the southbound exit lanes at exit 14. This is about four and a half acres of Georgia DOT and Federal Highway property that was empty. It was a blank slate. It was highly eroded. Um, and we began working um, all the way back in 2016 with the 2016 IRP for Georgia Power and the Public Service Commission, as well as with Georgia DOT, connecting those two agencies um, to allow Georgia Power to utilize the empty land to onboard a megawatt capacity of solar energy, um, which you see is represented by about 2,600 high efficiency solar panels. This is also the first pollinator friendly solar site brought online by Georgia Power. And it's the very first right of way solar site that is pollinator friendly in the entire country. Um, this site was commercialized in February of 2020 and Georgia is the third state to onboard renewable energy generation on the roadsides following Oregon in 2008 and Massachusetts during the 20 teens. Where we sit now is at an inflection point with DOTs assessing their roadside land for renewable energy generation. Next slide, please. In fact, in late April, the Federal Highway Administration issued sweeping guidance, making it clear that appropriate and desirable utilization of roadside lands on the interstate and highway system should include renewable energy generation, also EV charging and EV charging in a lane through inductive or wireless technologies, and also clean energy transmission buried in the right of way. Um, we at the Ray are working on projects um, on all of these fronts, but in particular, um, we have been communicating with DOTs across the country about the potential to onboard uh, renewable energy generation and particularly solar arrays like the one on the Ray Highway um, into communities and interstate rights of way across the country. In the year 2020, the Ray worked with UT Austin and the Weber Energy Group to analyze the 48 contiguous states the interstate system and the right of way that was available and appropriate for solar only at exits. So only at diamond and cloverleaf interchanges. And we found with UT Austin that there is approximately 52,000 acres of empty underutilized land at diamond and cloverleaf interchanges across the 48 states that would be appropriate for solar development. Um, we estimate that the capacity of solar energy generation is around 23,000 megawatts, which could power more than 12 million electric vehicles in a year. And I'm going to come back later to that point of linking solar energy with EV charging infrastructure for our ever-growing fleet of electric vehicles in this country. 
But I just want to stay on that point for one more minute. 52,000 acres of empty roadside land. We just heard Mike from the Nature Conservancy talk about low impact siting. I can't think <laughs> of less impact of solar siting than building out renewable energy generation on the roadsides of our interstate system where the soils and the land has already been degraded by 60 years of high uh, traffic volume and high speeds. Um, this is also an opportunity with pollinator friendly solar for us to actually rehabilitate, re rehabilitate those soils over time. So I'm building a win, 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 um, which is at least a three for and maybe a four for um, by just breathing new life, new purpose, and new pro productivity into these roadside lands. Next slide, please. I'm going to go through these slides quickly. Mike made mention of a solar siting tool that the Nature Conservancy has developed, which is amazing. Um, we at the Ray have worked with a company called Esri. They do GIS mapping for almost all of the DOTs. And so we at the Ray are using real DOT roadside data sets. They're specific data sets of what they have, not only on the roadsides, but also at visitor centers, rest areas, truck parking, and their maintenance facilities. And we're able, with Esri's help, to analyze that property for solar radiation, um, also for solar economics and solar value. And the tool also incorporates um, uh, digital twinning so that we can determine if there are any undesirable societal impacts that would be associated with any of the projects that we're planning. So what you're seeing right now is the real roadsides of an interstate system in Iowa. Esri developed a solar preference tool specifically for the ray. So the areas that you see shaded in bright green are highly preferred for roadside solar development. Next slide, please. And you can see in uh, the line that goes down the middle of the image that we can also swipe on and off to compare existing tree cover with uh, solar radiation without the tree cover. So the tool actually makes comparisons um, for scenarios like we've had across the state in Georgia where the DOT uh, uh, accomplished a lot of tree cutting all the way back to their DOT fencing. So this tool gives us the ability um, to plan in various scenarios that DOTs might want to consider. Next slide, please. Um, and then we can actually put solar panels um, into place in the rights of way. In this particular real world example in Iowa, you can see that there's a scenic turnaround at the top of the hill. And so we used the uh, digital twin and the AI uh, technology embedded in the tool to evaluate any impacts to the view shed. Next slide, please. And this is um, it, shaded in pink are the negative or the undesirable impacts to the view shed. Um, we can actually relieve those impacts by removing uh, uh, columns or rows of those solar panels. And we can then proceed with confidence with any state DOT from planning and assessment of societal and environmental impacts um, to execution of the deal with the DOT. Next slide, please. Before I get into EV charging, I just wanna quickly say, um, we at the Ray are working now in 14 states with more than 20 transportation organizations. I'm actually coming to you from Nashville where we met with Tennessee DOT this morning. Many of the states we're working with are working with the Ray because of our expertise that we've developed in roadside solar. Um, in addition to working with state governments, we're also working with county governments like Charleston County and the city of Austin to understand what municipal and county land holdings might be um, converted into renewable energy generation in a way that respects environmental impacts as well as societal impacts. And last but not least, I just wanted to end with the importance of EV charging. Um, James, I think you mentioned that we expect to see millions more electric vehicles on our roads over the next 10 years. The estimates are somewhere between 18 and 20 million EVs new to American roads by 2030. Um, I think you must have been living under a rock if you didn't see the F-150 Lightning yesterday that our president drove around. That truck is hot and they, I'm so proud of Ford. Um, I love our friends at Rivian, but I'm glad that Ford was able um, to unveil that uh, F-150 EV version um, and to, to have it uh, 
to have it profiled in that way uh, with the White House was really cool. Um, I guess the point that I wanna make here more than anything is as we build out EV charging infrastructure on our roadsides of the interstate and highway system, please, please, please do not install 50 kW charging. Please don't install 50 kW charging. It will create a really bad experience for the drivers. It will create um, complaints into state DOTs and other transportation operators. And it may cause Americans who opt into EVs to opt out because a 50 kW charging station will not appropriately charge in a short enough time the vehicles that VW, Kia, and Ford will produce. In fact, the VW ID4 was announced to have the capability of charging 60 miles in 10 minutes. That's at least 100 kW charging. <laughs> so at the Ray, we feature 175 kW charging by ABB. It's a modular unit, so we can actually just add another pedestal to get 350 kW. This is the kind of charging infrastructure that we need on our interstate and highway system to create the charging experience that drivers will need and expect. And yes, this charging can be um, supported by solar energy. We have 12 solar panels supporting um, our EV charging at the Ray Highways Visitor Center at the Georgia-Alabama state line. And I'm often asked, um, how can I, by DOTs, how can we bring on 100 kW or 150 kW charging at our visitor centers and rest areas in rural areas? You know we don't have the power there, Allie. How am I going to get the power there? And do you know what we tell them at the Ray? Build solar energy. Solar-powered EV charging is a viable option. Everyone needs to Google GridServe in the UK. They have onboarded 36 EV chargers in one single EV forecourt. The EV charging offered is as fast as 350 kW, and it's backed by battery storage and megawatts of solar power. It's a really great um, reference point for us in the United States as we build out charging on the interstate system for passenger vehicles and in the near future for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Next slide, please. That's me and that's the Ray. Thank you so much for the ability to participate in this. If you wanna reach out to us, we're very accessible. Harriet at the Ray.org, Allie at the Ray.org. Also my colleague, Laura Rogers, Laura at the Ray.org. Um, we're super busy and super prolific on social media as well. So hit us up sometime and let us know how we can help um, to make transportation cleaner, safer, and more productive. Allie, that was fantastic. I'm so proud of all you're continuing to accomplish. And I got a, a big, big smile last Thursday. I went by the Ray DOT solar project and not only was it beautiful, but the pollinator friendly vegetation around it was in full bloom and it was a, it was a garden. And I just smiled about your contribution, uh, not only the DOT solar, but also pollinator friendly solar and thinking about, you know, more than just gear in the field. So thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, a couple of quick takeaways were uh, 53,000 acres of basically unproductive land that's just sitting there. Um, 18 to 20 million EVs, you know, this is gonna happen really quickly. And we need to encourage policymakers and utilities to, to radically accelerate what they're doing. And then obviously it needs to be the right infrastructure to support that charging. So not, not these low end discount kind of chargers that aren't gonna work very well. So thank you very much. Um, any quick questions for Allie or we wanna save those? We've got a couple in that one says, any plans of using an open area around the Atlanta airport for solar panels? Um, I've talked with them for that about 14 years in a row and um, wonder why it's still not there, but um, any thoughts around that? Any ways to, to accelerate that acceptance of new ideas, new thinking? Many, many airports around the country have solar. Yeah, these are no regrets solutions, um, building solar at airports and on the roadsides. Both require glint glare studies. Um, this is best practice not complicated. Um, and we should be doing this at the Atlanta airport and airports across the state. Absolutely. So Judy Adler asked, you know, what Georgia public policies can we put in place to drive low impact solar development? So you've answered some of those, but I'll, I'll let you just hit that, that fastball out, out of the park there. Yeah, I think there's um, actually a, a bill that was filed late in the session this year, if I'm not mistaken, 299, I think is the bill number. 
That's um, right. Everyone needs to take a look at this bill. It's sponsored by Jeff Mullis, who's the Senate Rules Chairman. He's like one of the most powerful people in the building. And he's uh, the sponsor of this bill. It's got a ton of other great people signed on to the bill, like Senator Randy Robertson, who represents the Ray. <laughs> Um, but it's a distributed generation solar bill. And I think it's got um, a lot of, there's a lot of good in that bill. And we're hoping to have um, perhaps some hearings on that bill over the interim leading into the 2022 session. Yeah, yeah. And if I, I could add, you know, of course, um, rooftop and other uh, distributed generation in, in many ways is the best alternative because it's being built in the built environment already. Um, so it, it is by definition, you know, low impact in that respect. Um, and one of the other, the policy techniques that have been used in some other states uh, has been to develop what are called renewable energy zones, where uh, it, local officials and utilities and others have worked together to make the process of developing a solar facility quicker and easier if it's done in an area that's been designated as low impact. So, so again, you know, how do you reduce the cost and speed up the the development process, if you actually identify in advance where are the renewable energy zones that fit that matrix, you can do that. Um, that's a, a work in process with Georgia. Ali, outstanding, thank you so much. At this point, we're gonna to transition to Linwood Coleman, who's the Chief Program Officer of Groundswell. And I'll let him tell you a little bit about Groundswell and the solutions that they're focused on. Linwood, please take it away. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, spending so much time in Georgia, I feel like I'm at home there. Uh, let's talk briefly about Groundswell. Groundswell was created in 2009 with a vision focused on helping our low moderate income communities. And the best way to do that is what we're talking about today, clean energy, that impact and what it does for the family. It's more than just clean energy. And our brief time to speak today, we're gonna to talk about the climate solutions and, and go beyond as to how we transition from carbon to that clean energy uh, project called solar. Uh, Groundswell's team is a small team, but it's a mighty team of 14 and consultants. We're currently in about six states coming from New York all the way into Georgia, North Carolina, swinging back up into DC, which is headquarters, the DMV area. And we love what we do. We like to change the lives of the communities we serve. As I listened to my colleagues talk briefly today and, and got to see what we're doing on a large scale, I looked a little deeper into what that meant for all communities. The solar program is an extensive one that many of the big companies make great money from. But we keep forgetting it's the little people who build those solar programs and make sure that those solar panels work. And we would like to make sure through the Groundswell vision that they are a stakeholder in this clean energy. So you hear words like energy justice, sustainability, and then we wanna make sure that when we use these words, they impact the programs that we're listening and hearing about today. How do we do climate solutions? I believe that you start and look down into the weeds as we would call it and look up. Who is impacted the most and who is most least forgotten in the process? Uh, we say low and moderate income communities. 80% of this country is low and moderate. And with saying that, we say this, 50% is moderate and 30% is low. That tells two stories. Many of the communities that we need the solar energy to go into are the last to have a word. And that's extremely alarming to many societies. Even our president today states, our stimulus packages must focus on those who need it most and to improve the communities that we live in. So when we take the solar concept and what it means as clean and renewable energy, we need to make sure that every stakeholder is at that table. What does that impact mean to us? 
It means a couple of things. It means that when you build it, you build it thinking about every community and not just a few communities. Next slide. Scalable solar in Georgia. What does that mean? Um, my CEO, Michelle Moore, plays an uh, intricate role in what we do in Georgia because it's her home. And as her partner, chief program officer, we make sure that vision comes through every day and every thought and question that we look at as we try to improve the lives in those communities that would cover Atlanta, LaGrange, West Point, East Point, Hogansville, and Woodbury. And we're still growing. We have learned some things that are extremely important just from being around in the market and being in DC and understanding what low moderate income communities mean. It's one thing to see them on the highway, but Georgia must also understand that without the SRACs and the tax incentives and all of the other um, incentives that can improve the inner communities, they will be left behind. We can put everything up and down the highway and on top of a factory that we want. But if you leave out the least, they will be left behind as this community and this environment changes and understands the fact that renewable energy is the way of the future. So how do I use the word scalable? How many jobs are created that take low moderate income communities and make them far more sustainable? That's what scalable means to Groundswell. How many families improve and allow their children to get higher education through scalable solar? And then what does that look like when we span that over generations as we try to eradicate poverty? That's scalable. And we can measure that by how we allow the stakeholders to play a part in the new frontier of clean energy. Next slide. Affordable and accessible, that, where, that is where energy justice plays a role. Groundswell's vision focuses on that everyone has the right to clean energy. It's an inalienable right, not one for just those who have the dollars and cents in education to move forward and buy what they want and envision it and make it happen. That is affordable. Is it accessible? It means does it reach into communities in a positive way that even the low moderate income communities can benefit and understand and be educated by what that impact makes to those communities. We look at LaGrange Housing Authority. We look at the airport. I heard a brief mo moment uh, or expression about airports. We are working toward trying to put solar on these airports, but we all must address, we, all, we also have to address that the fact that the policies must change so that that excess energy can be utilized in more positive ways to serve the community. We believe in community solar, and that is an avenue in which we can create and improve and provide opportunities for all to participate in solar energy. Next slide. We have many programs since we have moved into the Georgia market. We uh, have a program called Breaking Barriers. And we take that same vision, that same approach that you've heard earlier to impact our HBCUs. What, what am I saying? that minorities many times are left out of that process even when they're in the greatest institutions of education to be a part and a player. Breaking Barriers takes the concept of taking all of our HBCUs and creating a microgrid, a solar component, uh, a battery storage and a resiliency hub, and then a curriculum to do what? keep our youth in the running and competitively involved in this changing world that we call clean energy. This is impacting not just the universities because we take that energy now and we focus it into West 
Georgia to help who? Low moderate income communities from disasters, education, showing them how to live, the whole component of what we believe is the best way to make it scalable. That hub that you see, Spelman, Morehouse, <laughs> Clark, and Atlanta University say, should say enough to everyone, let's all play at an even playing field. Everyone should be at the table as a stakeholder. Next slide, please. So, save on utilities. We talk about how clean energy is important, but let's take a deeper dive. When we talk about low moderate income communities, they know how to make a dollar go much further than us who have far, far more means and resources at our table. Take a family that has $50, which is the average that can be saved on a solar credit when we put in a, a, a solar array. That $50 determines the medication it could possibly buy. You could put a couple of bags of groceries on the table that we would say, ah, oh, that's nothing. But for that community, that's a lot. We must understand that what is affordable has to be affordable across the board based upon the lifestyles, the economics, and then the way we live. Should what we call affordable be for a millionaire, what it should be for an individual who's making only $1,200 a month? I think not. That's not affordable. But we must think outside the box. That's how we can make it affordable and then raise up our brothers and sisters. With that, we turn around and we look at how do you pay and save and how do you approach that? Reducing those utility bills is one thing. Educating and providing economic streams and creating uh, minority small businesses is the next step. That is where our country is going today. So we must not just look at the grand pictures and scales of solar. We must understand how we as a country take this so that it is equitable to all. Next slide. And I might be on my last. All right, we're back at Drawdown, Georgia. So inclusion, in conclusion, what I would like to say is that we as a collective body of individuals in this meeting today should be working together, together, collaborating together in one, one focused direction in a positive way to serve all, not just the few. With that, I turn it back to my host. Lynn Wood, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for that inspiring presentation. And, you know, I, as, as I sit here thinking about my takeaways from this, I mean, certainly, you know, as, as I opened with my mantra of solar for everyone everywhere is just the way we should think about it. And you are putting that into action around energy justice and sustainability and sustainable living. Um, the stat you gave about 80% of households being in low and moderate income communities was, was way larger than I thought. So thank you for sharing some context and background on this, this important topic. And thanks for the work that you're doing. I, I will mention, um, I did a, a good bit of work in, a few years ago with Fort Valley and uh, we were working with Georgia Power. So you might wanna get connected on that. I don't know the status of that project, but uh, that was a larger scale project. So uh, definitely something to put on your radar if you're, if you're not working with them on it already. But, um, you know, a lot of really great things in your presentation. We've got um, a bunch of questions coming in um, around these topics. Um, I see uh, Dr. Marilyn Brown has mentioned the SOUL programs have such promise. Um, if you have a question uh, around that, Marilyn, you want to share a little bit more on that? I only see the first top of that message. There is a question about this recording. It will be made available on the YouTube channel. Um, Ali, thanks for your post in the chat, answering those questions around DOT solar and some of the other things. A um, lot, of, lot of really interesting uh, dialogue going on in the chat. Um, 
you know, we do have good utilities in Georgia. Georgia Power supports, owns, and operates the Ray. Uh, that's worth mentioning. Um, I applaud that innovation that they're doing. The uh, co-op Walton EMC, they, they have a great community solar program. It's priced at parity. So everybody gets to play. So it's a great example of no upfront costs, no ongoing commitment of a, a very fair, equitable, just, and economically sound program. It was a good deal for Walton to install clean solar energy for their members and their members are participating and sharing in that in, uh, in an economic manner. So, um, you know, we can truly create these win-win-win programs. So at this point, we've got a few more minutes. Um, any other uh, comments from our panelists? You, you guys have had some great things, but was there something that you thought, I often do this when, when a presentation starts, it's like, oh, I wish I'd said this. So, um, Michael, uh, anything you wish you had said or any comments um, about Linwood? It's a great presentation. Oh, I mean, this, this has all been really, really interesting, um, really exciting. And I think that, the, you know, one of the things that I take from it is the intersection of these, these projects, that they are not, they are not projects that run on separate tracks. And they, they, I see a lot of alignment uh, with, with these initiatives, and, and that gives me a lot of hope for the future. Okay, thank you. Allie? James. Oh, oh go ahead. James, we do have a couple of questions from the crowd and I'll, I'll read them out if it's hard to find them in your chat because I know it's busy there. Um, Marilyn had the question about, um, can we use PAYS, P-A-Y-S, to help bring solar to low income households in addition to the retrofitting that is the traditional application of PAYS? I think that's a question for you, Linwood. That is extremely a good question. I would say yes. Um, it would be every program that we look at, if it's mission aligned, plays a vital part in the success of our pro of the work that we do. Uh, as you ask that question, we have learned in understanding the environment that we work in in Georgia. It's not just bringing in the solar. When you do solar, you also have to look at the homes and the and the envelope that the individuals living in those homes, we look at mill homes. So they have to be retrofitted with insulation, uh, weatherization, sometimes even rebuilding or refurbishing the home, which allows many of our players here today to take a part in it. What Groundswell does is take those programs as pays, as, as a, into the soul program, and we call them wraparound services. Those wraparound services improve and heighten the concept of the SOL program in many ways. One, we've learned that not just improving solar, not just putting in weatherization, but then we need to deal and address the health issues that are there, the economics that are impacted by these communities that we have been in. So there is a place for every program that is in this room today or on this uh, a Zoom call and we challenge you all, reach out to us. Let's become closer partners in the process of improving the communities and the lives and the children that are impacted by what we're talking about today. Thank you, Linwood. And we had another question I think that might be for you, which is will Groundswell, um, regarding the agrivoltic program, will Groundswell consider in partnering with black farmers for solar farm projects? We would love that opportunity. Uh, let's make it very clear that the new funding that is coming down and the ability to sit down with these farmers and understand how we can, uh, mission, in, a, in a mission aligned way, impact how they do solar with their fields and bring them into the marketing. We have a program called Justice 40. And with that process, we're able to provide support and helping them be on the cutting edge of the funding that's coming out over the next year, years to come. And with that, we bring something to the table. The many times as you look at these businesses, as we focus on farmers, they don't know how to navigate through these applications. Well, we were granted and blessed with the opportunity. We can take that into these rural areas and aid them 
without them having to spend the dollars they normally would have to invest to ensure that they're in a competitive position to, to receive these funds. And this is critical in the funds that we see here today. We will not maybe see in our lifetime another opportunity to see the economic ability to raise up all of our different uh, uh, programs that impact low moderate income communities. As you notice in our slides, we address the human need. So you see a rainbow of colors that reach across the gamut. It's not just about colored faces. When we say 80% of low moderate income, there are white faces in there too. So let us keep real and be realistic in how we approach this process. Absolutely. Hopefully I answered your question. Linwood, thank you. Thank you. Allie, I'm going to let you get one more point in there. What, what was the one thing that you thought, oh, I should have said this too? Well, actually, Dr. Marilyn Brown reminded me with her pays question. So everyone check out House Bill 762. Misha Maynor represents West Atlanta all the way up to West Midtown. And as a freshman legislator, Misha Maynor passed an authority this session. Um, the authority is going to focus on the West Midtown area because it has the highest energy burden in the state. And it also leads for incarceration. Um, it has the lowest graduation rates. So Misha Maynard's authority is called the Fulton County Energy Enhancement and Technology Authority. And it is going to focus on bringing renewable energy and innovation to West Atlanta to not only relieve the energy burden, but also to provide workforce development and real job opportunities for um, the West Atlanta communities. Please go check it out. I think this is a great opportunity for Pay As You Save to, um, to make a real difference in West Atlanta, just like uh, Michelle and Groundswell and Linwood have done such a great job in LaGrange and in Hogansville. House Bill 762, Representative Misha Maynard. Awesome, thank you, Allie. So quick wrap up on a couple of questions left that I can hit quickly. Uh, Allie mentioned Senate Bill 299 and solar. So if, if you're at all interested in acting to help us move solar forward, get involved in that bill. Um, there was a question about city of Atlanta elections. So if you do not know Mandy Mahoney and Doug Shipman, who I know well, I'm supporting aggressively, please uh, check them out and, and look at what they're bringing to the table in leadership of solar energy efficiency, kind of the future of the city. Um, there was a question about recycling solar panels. They're very recyclable. There's a lot of disinformation out there about recycling solar panels. Happy to answer any of those questions. Final wrap up, the purpose of this session was on solutions. And both Michael, Allie, and Lynn Wood, you know, they're just, they're thought leaders. They're, they're bringing truckloads of solutions that are working in the real world um, to do more distributed uh, solar, more rooftop, more canopies, more landfills, more DOT solar, avoiding sensitive habitats, better siting, so tools for solutions, and that's really what this whole series is about, and I greatly appreciate you being with us today, and we're at 2.03, so we're right at the limit. Thank you, thank you, thank you.